Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Rich Redman here. Yes, it's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. Where we talk about all things like music, motivation, success. Hey, anything that comes up today, very excited. We got a new Nashvillian here today, originally from Detroit, truly a young lion, successful drummer, music executive, record producer. For the last nine years, he's been playing with the Motor City Madman, Ted Nugent. I'm talking about our new friend, Jason Hartless. What's up, buddy? Great seeing you, brother. Hey, man. Uh, you're not a new friend. We've, we've known each other for a good five, six years, but you're a new Nashvillian. Yes. You moved here in November, which means you've been here for about six months. You like it? Tell us about it. I've, I've always loved Nashville. You yeah. know, I've been commuting back and forth 10, 15 years. You know? So it, uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to you know see all the friends that I've known forever and would yeah. only see once or twice a year coming through. So yeah. that's well, great. Well, welcome. You know, They say it takes about two two years to really be a Nashvillian, but you're, you're fine. You have this pedigree. There's something in the water in Detroit, man. You got you know Nugent. You got the Motown sound. Kid Rocks from there, Bob. See, there's... What's the deal? It's in the water. I don't know, man. I mean, you, you look at the, the 60s and 70s, the amount of music that came out of Detroit, you know, not just Ted and Seeger, but, you know, Alice Cooper and MC5. And, yeah. you know, it's just so many, so many iconic bands. And, you know, even even all the way to the 80s and 90s, you know, a band called Toby Red that was amazing with Chad Smith before he joined Chili Peppers. Really? Okay. And, you know, Greg Bissonette came out of Detroit. That's right. And just, you know, so many amazing musicians. And, you know, there's, there's definitely is something in the water in that town yeah and you 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 reap the benefits at a young age you were playing at a high level what age was it that you started playing and your dad's a drummer yeah you know i uh my, my dad was was always around the scene back in the day and you know had some pretty good success you know in the midwest with his bands and um you know he was very close with ace fraley camp um you know him and Ace go back, you know, 35 plus years. Wow. And so I was kind of born into that music scene right away. Yeah. And, um, you know, around the time I was born, I, he kind of retired from playing and, you know, six months old, I was sitting on his lap banging away. And then sure enough, you know, by the time I could crawl in the kit myself, I was jamming with his buddies and, you know, then playing gigs around town when I was five and, you know, kind yeah. of that's, where everything started. Well, you are a great player, and I was—I love getting to do this podcast because I get to shine a light on on you know friends old and new. But yeah, you know, I get to do a deep dive, look at all these videos, even some covers you have where you're playing like a Who song. Uh, won't get fooled again, and you're just like nailing the the Keith Moon style. Not a chart in sight. Did, did you do it note for note, that cover? Well, I, I, the, the Who and Toto are my two favorite bands of all time. Okay, gotcha. So, you know, I, I studied those those tracks forever. Well, you got Studio Precision of Jeff, right? Mm -hmm. And then you got the Reckless Abandon of Keith. Yeah. And then you... It's like, you got your peanut butter in my child. Is that is that kind of like your your playing style? I, I would say, yeah. I, I mean, think so. You know, like, I, I, I've always been a... You know, a studio rat. I always been in the studio doing that thing, but I've also been a live guy for you know my my career. So yeah. I always like to be in that situation to where I can kind of mold myself into whatever drummer you can be. If you need a two and four guy, I can give you that. If you need a Keith Moon guy, I can give you that. If you need a funk guy, I can give you that. You know, and that's yeah. what keeps it, I think, interesting and fun about what we do as hired gun musicians is like you never know what the gigs are gonna call for. You yeah. know, I I was on tour with Jolyn Turner one time and. I literally flew back to Detroit, went straight to the studio, and cut a Big Bang Christmas album with some of Bob Seger's horn section. Nice, you know, going from Rainbow and Deep Purple to Big Band. Where in did you get the hours, Big Band experience? And you were like, you know, reading like net, like Nestico charts, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I've always loved '40s jazz. You know, and kind of even since I was very little. Big band, 40s jazz has just always been some of my favorite stuff. Basie, Ellington. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, even then you add, you know, Buddy and, and Gene and, you know, yeah. Louis Belson and all those classic drummers, too. Like, I've, I've always tried to approach my playing very similar to a big band drummer in that you're playing off the band versus just yeah. playing a beat, you know, playing playing a groove. You have some sort of lope in whatever you're doing, yeah. you know, that kind of still hands back to that big band 40s drumming this is what this is you can't teach your level of experience in your natural talent because when you watch someone like you 
I was saying to yourself, this guy did not learn how to play drums from a Hal Leonard book. And it was like, you just jumped into the deep end of the pool and started playing music at a very young age. I think you're barely like at the tender age of 29 or something. Yep. And it's like, you really play like a 59 year old man. You know what I mean? It's There's a lot of experience there. And the, the double bass stuff that you do at the at the end when you're playing, you know, your, uh, your trash can endings with, uh, with Ted, fantastic hand and foot combinations, double bass speed. Did I see you were playing some dates with Halloween, or is it Halloween? Yeah, Halloween. Yeah, is uh, that a European band? No, Detroit band actually. Ah. Um, but they, you know, they're big in the than the European and Mexico. And do they only work one day a year? Pretty, or yeah, pretty, okay, yeah, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> so they, you know, they'll they'll do the big giant you know festivals in Germany or whatever, and you know the drummer couldn't get over there, so they called me to do it. It's so, like, a duk -a -duk -a -duk -a -duk -a like super super metal, nice double bass, fast stuff. So let's say hi to our friend Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers .com. I was just going to sit over here in my ashtray. No, we, we <laughs> just, just, you know. No, because everybody knows that Jim is a is a great drummer, and there would be no Rich Redman show without Jim. He is the secret weapon. We had a nice little dinner party the other night, and we put a hurting on a uh, nice box of wine. It's in in in, in Jim's Look, defense. Don't, don't you know throw shade on the box of no, wine? No, he goes. There's this, a lot of value there. There's value. Right? He goes. This is four bottles of wine in one That's box right. can't go wrong so no uh not my gal Kara made it some nice food and um jim's wife courtney brought her famous homemade bread the b red oh so That's great. right so jim um <clears throat> i'm sure that you've seen jason play at some point online or somewhere with ted nugent he's had the job for the last nine years he's just a young lion man he's a great rock drummer anytime you see him playing any style you say to yourself that's what that guy does it's right. almost like you know omar akeem i remember omar akeem saying i love drummers where you go and you would see it and you're like that's what that guy does when you realize oh my god a guy like omar akeem he does this kid does everything he's not even 30 years old that's incredible. You, you just found your calling very early on. Yeah, very that's fortunate. A, that's a gift, to find your calling and your purpose. Do you remember when you started playing like that? What age? I, you know, I just, I've been doing it so long, it's, it's, it's hard to remember. You it's know? just in your and DNA. When did you start playing? Professionally, five years old. And then I started touring. Um, <laughs> Don't forget to pay the five-year-old. We're paying. <laughs> he gets paid in candy. Okay, what does that look like, a five-year-old professional drummer? Yeah. What does that What does that mean? Was that you got you well, got paid? Kind well, of thing? you know, it, you know, playing local gigs, you know, the, the top forty covers type stuff. You know, nothing. You know, this is way pre YouTube and and all that stuff. Oh yeah, you know, so twenty five years ago, playing playing, you know, in in local clubs around town with you know my dad's buddies and stuff like that, and you know, kind of cut my teeth super early. And so twenty five years ago, for twenty nine years ago rather, you're looking at uh, not twenty five. You're looking at so you're th almost thirty now. You're five, so about. 24 years ago mm -hmm. so you're looking at uh 2000 yep and a lot of the uh the youtube generation didn't come to be until 06 07 08 but you still had people probably getting video of this yeah abso point, absolutely think, right? you know and and you know luckily you know uh, my, my parents would always kind of film some of this stuff so i got a lot of this you know video footage in you know i've been able to share it and you know and even you know my dad played pearl drums and you know i'm a i've been a pearl artist for 20 years now Beautiful. um and there's some classic photos because my dad's had this big giant pearl drums banner behind his kit so yeah. there's video of me when i'm you know two years old just playing this kit in this giant pearl drums even behind. promoting the product not even knowing it. <laughs> exactly exactly he, they signed him at nine years old i mean that's when a company really believes in you that's incredible they're like we're investing in this kit for the long haul and yeah i'm sure your pearl rep comes out and it's and and you know you wine and dine them backstage and it, what a cool thing yeah it's it's been great you know it, it uh i I've, I've been so fortunate to have to kind of been where i've been at such a young age and you know now looking going on 30 i'm like damn i'm i'm old but then I, think, <laughs> yeah, buddy. You know, I gotta i gotta keep i gotta keep reminding myself i was like damn it's okay well you it's know. wait because you started way early because obviously you're so busy playing getting experience getting paid um College didn't do college. You were just yeah. Um, you, you did college. Yeah. So I um, I graduated from Berkeley. Um, oh, you a, were a rare graduator. Mm, yeah. Yes. But I but I actually uh, I was a music business major Smart. and um, I started my degree two weeks before I got the call for Nugent. And because, you know, I didn't want to up and move to Boston for four years. And, you know, so I went the online approach. So I all through college, I was on the road, you know, doing my degree. 
You know, I'd and be, then rocking with the Music City Madman. Yep. The Motor City Madman. You're the Music City Madman. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> but, so, well, that's that's impressive. Congratulations, and I think that's a, a, a product, a byproduct of the times that we're in, being able to go to college online. And it's like I remember the whole college experience for me was like I lived in 317 Clement Hall in Lubbock, Texas, and I had the meal program where you can eat the three meals a day and you got to ride your bike to your music theory class. And it was the whole thing. You know what I mean? That whole thing. You're going to ride a skateboard to your music theory Uh, class. You know, you had the bike and, you know, it's just (laughs) going across. Occasionally you would leave the music building to go because you would have to take a physics class, physics of sound, or you'd have to take an algebra class or American history. And, and But most of the time, you are in that music building, and you're playing temps and vibes and marim, all this stuff that a lot of times I didn't want to do. Right. But I said, you know, I have to do this. Just jump through these hoops, kid. So you got this practical degree. You got the, uh, a music business degree. And you've been dabbling in the business side of uh, the business for a long time. What are some of those jobs? Vinyl? You were mentioning vinyl. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've kind of run a couple of companies, including my own um, Sound City Music Group um, for wow. the last number of years, yeah. and you know, I do that with my dad. And um, you know, it's it's great because I've always been a vinyl guy, and you know, enjoyed it, and even before the hood, you know, huge huge resurgence. So, um, you know, we partnered with uh, Third Man Jack White's pressing plant in Detroit. So we've been great partners with them and Amazing. manufacturing all of our stuff. But you know, I've done I've been you know working with the sweet, you know, seventies glam rock band for yeah. you know the last five, six years and, you know, I've been archiving all the Nugent stuff the last number of years and we've put out a bunch of, you know, stuff like that. And we just put out Steeler, Ingve Malmsteen's first band and and, you know, Sparks and The Knack and bunch of bunch of cool stuff. What like about that. the knack? Because that literally that just that record dropped forty five years ago five days ago or something yeah. like that yeah we just uh past november put out um the knack live in 1980 in in holland oh you know God. super gary cool. gary he was who was the drummer in in the knack gary Ga- um i'm blanking oh his name well pat torpy played drums pre mr big with him too I, with them too but and then uh but yeah I'm, I'm but blanking. he was the house drummer at Capitol records yep. also and he was died way too young but um, we'll he, get, is, he is one of the most underrated drummers. Absolutely. So good. Oh, now, my gosh. He now, was amazing. You, you might know this, but the, the engineer, Pete Coleman, he engineered all the Blondie records, all the Pat Benatar records, and he engineered the Knack recording. So he recorded Ni- My Sharona, and he said, these guys were so good, and they were such a hot band in L.A. They played every night of the week all over Los Angeles. They basically just sat up in the studio and... Pete pressed record and they ran the whole record down. Not surprising. I mean, that that whole first record to me is a perfect album, top to bottom. Yeah. Just raw performances, great songs, just yeah. perfect record. So vinyl is profitable. Yeah. I mean, in 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 this day and age when we're especially we're dealing with all the stuff with Spotify and all the stuff with all the touring promoters and things of that nature, you know, vinyl seems to be the only viable outlet for a lot of these artists yeah. you know unless you're a massive massive artist a lot of these indies are still able to actually do work and make some good money off of it yeah they're actually and calling people back they have to find like labor to put uh put press the records oh yeah i yeah. mean it, it, it's there's so many there's more and more pressing plants opening i mean uh i'm, I'm blanking on which oh, i think which, there's quite a few here i believe yeah there's two two or three here i mean united's still here they've mm-hmm. been here forever um but you know detroit's got two i mean metallica literally they were pressing so much that they just straight up bought a pressing plant yeah. and i think i don't remember which which one they did but lars is like just sell one of my art pieces and we'll buy the yeah, factory exactly you know and, and it's crazy because it it, it, it you know I'm, I'm 29 growing up as a late millennial you know just barely making the um the cut the gen z yeah it's uh you know we grew up with still tangible items we still grew up with cds and and you know it wasn't really cassettes but you know i remember i was 10 getting an ipod and you know we didn't really have the digital aspect of it you know i i love streaming as a consumer but of course us as a as musicians and creative types it, it hinders us so Having vinyl helps bring back that kinesthetic quality that, you know, I think music has been lacking since streaming and digital has kind of come about because you're paying $10 for a digital album or paying your monthly fee to stream whatever you want, but you don't hold something. You don't have an art piece, you know, and that's a big thing that I've always tried to do is every art um, that would be on vinyl records that I would do, always top notch. 
Well, even like, you know, there's Beautiful. such a tactfulness to the notion of vinyl anyway. I'm going to pull a, a Joe Rogan and, and find out who the drummer was for the knack. <laughs> He's, it sounds so familiar, like I should know it off no, the top of my Gary anyway. Bruce. Yeah, Gary Bruce. Yeah. I was thinking so, Gary Novak the whole time. Sorry. Right, yeah. Like even, do you remember putting vinyl on and, you know, some kids back in the 70s and everything, or even the 60s, would put the speaker like on their chest or on their belly and lay on the floor. You know, and as the record would play, it was it was such a tactile experience wow. back in the day. Well, I mean, you're 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 putting something on, and then you know, in 15, 20 minutes, you're gonna have to get up and flip it anyways. You right. know, and you've so you're got a little exercise. Too. Yeah, you get a little exercise. <laughs> you get the holding art piece. You yes. know, it's 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 great. And you know, these artists are now able to you know sign you know these these jackets and sell them for a premium, and then that consumer can either put it up on their wall as an art piece, or they can keep it in their vinyl collection. Yeah. You know, there's multi facets to it, and it's it's always plus the fact that it sounds unbelievable if you've got it really system. is the fidelity on them are just undeniable. it's un un unmatched you know? even when it's a modern recording that was recorded to pro tools and then transferred oh yeah you know even even so there's there has been situations where uh the only uh format that i have to put on you know vinyl is a digital format just because the tapes are lost or whatever yeah. and even then even with a little bit of mastering job you know it's still going to sound a heck of a lot better than it would digitally yeah interesting well i mean it's uh even my kids are getting into it they all they both like cammy and spencer have record players and they listen to vinyl yeah you know there's those really cute little affordable ones that they have at urban outfitters yeah the 99 nine dollar crosley specials or whatever yes yeah. because and they'll have them in like these little hipster hotels yep, in austin yep, yep. and stuff um i have the audio technic i forget the model number but it's like very popular mm -hmm. um is that pretty good, or do like, I, I, I've got I've got one just like that too. Yeah. You know the three hundred dollar audio. Do you do the thing with the tubes and the? And no, the, no I, I don't. I don't get to that point. You know, yeah. I got good Bose sound system. And, like Mark Maron's, know. like I got the one with the tubes and right. the, you know it's like <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's 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 uh, all those audio files. It's it's all yeah. what on their taste is. But yeah. you know, if you get a good turntable and a good needle and good speakers, that's all you really need. Yeah. yeah. I do want to get back into it because it does sound like a fun evening to like light a candle, pour a glass of red wine, and then you're like, tonight's Blue Note night, and you just all your Blue Note recordings. Tonight's, you know, tonight's my, you know, Detroit. Like, we'll do all the Detroit artists exactly. and you drop the needle, and you're reading the credits, and it just sounds like a fun well, time. Well, even then, <laughs> me, me, me as a as a you know audio technical nerd, you know, I I I love also comparing the old masters of the original pressing compared to the modern, you know, 2023 or 2024 masters that they've done. And yeah. just hearing the difference in the mix and, you know, how it kind of conveys, it's just there's so many different outlets, you know, that and, and parts of that vinyl collecting thing, you know, that is just it, it's just amazing. Yeah. So um, uh, tell us about um, Ted, because that's the elephant in the room. What are the qualifications for working with this guy? Well, you know, he... he is it pretty smooth? Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I, he's he's one of the best artists I've ever worked with. I yeah. mean, he's just super easy to get along with. You know, nice. he treats my family like family. You know, one of the nicest human beings in the world. Awesome. You know, and then you add the fact that he's one of the greatest guitar players that ever walked the face of the earth. It's just amazing, you know, nine years that I've had with him. You know, we did our last uh, long tour last year. You know, he's not retired. We're doing two shows this year. You know, so things will pop up here and there, but yeah. you know he's seventy six, still in the shape of oh my god! But, but he's in the shape of a fifty year old, and he's playing yeah. better than ever. You know, nice. and what's great about that gig is you know it's always keeps you on your toes. Yeah. You know, he'll pull out songs that we haven't done in two years. So there's a set stage. list, kind of. Yeah, there's a set list, kind of, but it, you know, it, it, the songs will randomly show up, or we'll be walking on stage, and he's like, "All right, we're doing this tonight." And I'm like. I, I've never heard this song in my life. <laughs> and, you know, Watch me. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's uh, it's it's great. And you know, his it, it, we we had you know we've always run a three piece since I've been in the band, and you know that just that old school, sixties seventies just power trio rock stuff is just amazing and what's great about it it's it's all a lot of jamming going on so, so it's like van halen style so when he goes to do a guitar solo the chord changes no one is marking the chord changes exactly. except for bass exactly wow yeah it's great you know and and it has a lot of, like when he first called me on the gig he's like i i want a drummer that's a mix of john bonham meets Stuart copeland meets uh, Johnny Benanjic meets uh, Keith Moon, and I'm who's like, Johnny Benanjic? Uh, the drummer of the Detroit Wheels. Ah, oh, gotcha. Um, okay, I should know and, that. And the Rockets, um, yeah. iconic Detroit drummer. Another one, just 
you know, icon. Shame on you, Rich. Okay, footnote. Um, we got to check this out. But uh, <laughs> and, which is which is you know Ted's all time. You know the Mitch Ride and Detroit Wheels is just the pinnacle of of what did Ted looks at music as. Yes. Um, you know, but it's it. I was like, yeah, I can I can do all that. And, nice. And it's just been such a fun you know nine years and you know. Yeah, you is that great play, uh, higher by Damn Yankees? Are you doing no? We I mean, the only Damn Yankees we ever do is we'll do like a small snippet of you know Don't Tread on Me, but everything else is just all Ted's catalog and right. you know because some, some of these songs are they're, they're just too iconic that you can't cut them from the set. There's a million songs that you want to always add, but you know Strangleholds nine minutes as it is. Yeah, you know you're doing an hour and a half set. Great, you guys Buffalo's. do nineties. Yeah. 90, um, 90 minutes yeah, sets? Yeah, yeah, usually. Leave them wanting more, you know. Exactly. That's the country music model is we do not, it's like, when I when I think about like Springsteen, you know, doing like four hours. It's That's like, too much. I got to pee, man. I <laughs> yeah, got exactly. to pee. Yeah. <laughs> I got to pee right now. Look at all my liquids, guys. If you guys are watching this, my friend Bobby Mertz got this for me. That's what I do. I play drums. It's my nice coffee mug. I got my Michael Buble, and I got some like cold water. Michael here. Buble. Yeah. My Michael Let Buble. me, uh, I'm going to get that on camera here real quick. Hold on. What's yeah. that? I got I got a drink cam. Let me zoom in on Oh, yeah, drums. That's mm -hmm. what I do. I play drums. Nutrition facts. Um, it says talent, 100%. Um, skill, 500%. Passion, 100%. Creativity, 300%. Um, caffeine, 110%. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Bobby Mertz got, got this for me. So we're kind of just jumping around all, all, all over the place today, which is kind of we do that. But I'm just so excited to be around your, your young energy. And I think it's just... I mean, I have youthful energy. You, you totally do, Rich. But I'm probably that, the oldest guy in the room. Yeah. Right now, so. <laughs> now you know, we've Tommy Clefettas moved to town, yes. right? Yeah. So Tommy played in with Mitch Ryder, right? Yeah, yeah. So Tommy was actually my drum teacher, and then uh, and yeah, why he was playing for Ted actually. Um, yeah. I was like ten years old or something like that, and taught me for a while. And but yeah, his his dad is a was a big um, you know band leader, and every time I played with Mitch Ryder, his dad is who's hired me on the gig. So you guys have I'm not calling it nepotism, but but it is your dad, your second generation musicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like in the blood. So Tommy did a cool little um, clinic over at Forks Drum Closet, and he's become like good friends with Greg Morrow. And and like I went and we we hugged it out and he's like yeah I want to do the podcast um, but it's so funny because I remember my one of my first marquee jobs I was 29 I was playing with a gal named Pam Tillis she was the daughter of Mama Mel Tillis and uh, we I was in a uh, elevator getting into an elevator with my Pam Tillis band in Los Angeles and coming off the elevator was Tommy Clefettas and the Ted Nugent band and I I said I said what's it like working with Ted he's like. It's one of a kind, man. There's only one of them. No, they broke the mold, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's cool. And I got to see you guys at the Saban Theater in Beverly Hills. You killed it. We hadn't met at that point. Yep. But I was like, look at that kid. I told my friend of mine, I was like, I think he's like 24 years old. Or so. He's, they're like, what? He's killing it. He's playing like a 44-year-old man. Great job, man. I oh, appreciate it. Appreciate and you guys, it, a lot of it has been documented. Do you have some DVDs, a couple albums? Yeah, I've done two records with Ted, and, and we shot a DVD, I think 2017 or What's something. What's the recording like process? Does he does he record in Detroit live, like everybody on the floor at the same time? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we did one record down in Waco, Texas, and then the last record, Detroit Muscle, we, you know, we did the entire record in like three days, but it was learning the record playing the record first or second take we did it in his barn in michigan nice. we brought all this vintage neve stuff in so it was it was awesome you know just super old school organic you know stuff you can't most people don't do nowadays honestly does he count off the songs live or do you because i don't even see a tempo reference oh, he, on oh, stage he, oh he does 100 percent. i never i don't see a rhythm watch or anything no i mean there's there's you know depending on how he's feeling that night those there's times where we've played stuff super fast and there's times we've done stuff super slow it just depends on how, yeah. you know what his mood is that night Interesting. And again that's what i love about it. it's that old school organic you know i we've all done gigs where we're on clicks and yeah. back and tracks and and loops and stuff which there, is there's which, no budging which is great yeah i mean but at the end of the day it's 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 brings that that musician organic quality back to it when you're just going for it yeah, yeah. And you've got to work over the years, in addition to touring and recording with Ted, as I mentioned, Joe Lynn Turner, Mitch Ryder, uh, toured as support act with Motley Crue Godsmack. 
theory of a dead man drowning pool. So these are, it was this all with Ted and those. No, no. So I did the uh, Motley Crew Crew Fest two tour, which had most of those guys on it. Gotcha. Um, I was fourteen um, playing with uh, Brian Tram who kind of started my touring career. Um, he had, was with Uncle Cracker for a while and, oh, yeah. and then kind of branched on his own. So I was with him to when I was 12 to about 15, 16. And, you know, he really gave me my my start and, you know, that whole kind of boosted my career in a, you know, in yeah. a sense. And, uh, yeah, we did the whole three months with Motley Crue and Godsmack and Theory of a Dead Man. It was, it was wild. You, must, you really ha- must have had great parents, mentors... Because to be on the road at 14, like you're this pubescent guy, right? And it's like you're surrounded by topless women throwing bras on stage and it's booze backstage. And it's like, you're a good kid. Well, you know, uh, I, 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 I honestly, I didn't even touch a drop of alcohol until I was 21. Yeah. I've been around it for my whole life. Yeah. And, you know, my, my dad would always be on the road with me because his, his, you know, experience in the industry, he would be the tour manager. So it's like, why hire a tour manager when he's already going to be there anyways? Yeah. You know, so my dad was always there and it was, it was, it was a great, you know, experience for us to tour, you know, backwards and forwards of this country a million times. Yeah. And, you know what? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I've seen a lot of things in my, in my day, yeah. but you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm happy I came out, uh, <laughs> on the on the positive side. No, of you're definitely man. There's that's a lot of um, a lot of discipline there. Um, looking at some other things, you've worked with producers like, hey, we both worked with Dale Penner. Oh, really? Yeah, Dale was producing uh, like an Americana artist here in Nashville, and he wanted me to. The artist requested me to play drums, and he goes, "You, you, you got a great room. I want to use a lot of great outboard gear." So my friend, I don't know if you met Tony Mora yet, but mm. Anthony Mora's. Good, you know, New York guy's been here for forever and ever. We're dear friends, but he was one of the first guys in Nashville to create the, you know, float the floors, take his garage, do the thing. He's got like enough outboard gear to like, you know, to run the power station. Right. And, and, and so we went into his place and knocked out these tracks and got to, you know, hang out for a day or two at Dale and go eat sushi and stuff. Nice guy. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I worked with him 2007 up in Winnipeg, Canada with, yeah. with this artist I was talking about. And yeah, we were in this big giant mansion in Winnipeg, Canada in October and, you know, for a few days cutting some tracks. It was awesome. Yeah. Dale's, I keep in touch with him often. I love that. Great guy. He also worked with uh, guys like uh, Tom Morris, uh, Chuck Alcazian. Nice. Yeah, I've been very fortunate to, you know, because I've always tried to brand myself as just the one-stop shop guy. You know, I've been a big session guy. I've been a touring guy. You know, I just, just being able to just say yes when somebody comes at you. Now, do you, you know? like doing some teaching? Do you kind of have like a teaching philosophy? Will you do it if somebody says, hey... Can I take a lesson? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I back in Detroit, I was, um, you know, a, a teacher at one of the School of Rocks there for almost ten years. I love the School and, of Rock. Yeah. You know, it's a great, great program, great teachers. You know, it was, it was just a, um, a fun time to kind of step back. And I started teaching there when I was eighteen, so I wasn't that much older than some of my students. And yeah, you know, it. Uh, it kind of because I, I really didn't start taking one on one lessons until I was already in high school, you know, and, and done you know, a bunch of stuff. And, you know, my teacher, um, guy named George Dunn in Detroit, he just old school, you know, Greg Bissnett and him go way back. Wow. You know, so, so here's your rudiments, kid. Yeah, here's your swing beat. Here's your very, very old school. Like he started me from square one, you know, and yeah. took me from being a rock drummer to being a more resonant drummer, you know, and, and he also was my drumline teacher in, in high school. I was so, going to say in high school, so did I you? Had, so I had kind of the combination yeah. of the both and, you know, how I can take these, you know, marching rudiments and incorporate them on the kit and yeah. things of that nature. And he just completely changed my playing and, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. But, you know, coming from that aspect of being the, the, the student to, to the teacher was just a, a big, you know, kind of swift and, and, you know, kind of my whole outlook and how I even approach what I do for a living. Yeah. You know, um, like Hal Leonard had done, you know, I've done a DVD for them. Learn to rock drums with Jason Hartless and Friends, 2011, which means you were... Uh, I was still in high school when it came out. Um, seven, 16, 17, something that like that. That is so cool, man. And, you know, it was fun doing clinics, you know, around guitar centers and stuff like that. And, you know, it was a great experience. But, you know, again, like coming from that aspect of 
changing your whole mindset of just being a player and moving to be, okay, how can I help the next generation? How can I take everything that I've done in my career and, you know, help elevate those kids and get that, you know, those, those mentor moments that I got when I was a kid. Yeah. And um, it says that you have been mentored by Love Corky Lang, man. Do da da da. Tommy Clefettas, Eric Singer. We were just talking off camera a little bit about Eric Singer, Anton Fig. So these are, it's great. You have these guys, you, you, they're homies. You could like yeah. text them. Yeah. I mean, Eric, Eric's honestly one of the closest things I have to an uncle, even though he's not my uncle. Yeah. Um, you know, just been a great, great you know, friend and mentor over the years, Corky Lang, like, uh, I, I only did one solo racket in my life and it was when between time I was seven and 10. And it was honestly an excuse for Corky to come in and produce me through a recording session. Yeah. So Corky and me worked on that, you know, for a number of years, he'd drive down to Detroit from Toronto and, uh, you know, it was just an amazing experience. And, you know, um, like I learned how to chart music from Anton Fig, mm-hmm. and, you know, some of these guys have just been very fortunate to kind of been around when I was little and, yeah. um, you know, just really helped shape, you know, the, the player I am. Amazing. Isn't that fun, Jim, to be, you know, when your folks are in the music business, it's like you can adopt their Rolodex a bit and you're exposed to like great things. It's like Larry Aberman, our friend Larry, you know, growing up in like New York. It's like people that grow up in a New York or in LA. Look at Josh Fries. I mean, he was destined to be, you know, connected. He's born on Christmas Day. His dad <laughs> ran the music program at Disneyland. Right. Of course you're going to. You know what I mean? It's like, it's in your blood, man. Mm-hmm. That is so cool. I was like, my parents are are accountants and nurses, and we have no connection to the music industry. So I just had to, like, kick and claw and scratch and, like, who plays music? Right, exactly. You know what I mean? It's so cool. That's a cool thing. But you made it work. We all oh, made it work, yeah. yeah From the sweat just, just, of my brow. Just a little bit. I'm schwitzing here. Um, but I, I think you're going to have a great time in Nashville, and probably the next thing for you is, I mean, you're you're probably going to get super connected and be playing on big records that we hear on Music Row, and then you could either um, start ground level with some you know, cool singer songwriter, Americana girl that just grows up and is the next Miranda Lambert, or you're just going to get connected at the highest level. And, you know, you'll be getting that, that check for showing up for those 30 shows. I mean, this, the world's your oyster because I mean, I, I feel like this is one of the last cities for the music business, you know? Do I want to live in Nashville the rest of my life? I don't know, but it's like this is where the industry is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. everyone LA is moving here. Yeah, New York, you know, is is turning more and more just straight up Broadway musicals. You know, yes. so it's everyone's coming right here. You know, whatever last resort that we have still left of the music industry is is all right here. Yeah, you, know? you heard it here, guys. What do you think the next step for the music industry is? You, you know, know it, it's it's a it, it's a really tough thing, and I think about this a lot. You know, with you know, we're even seeing the vinyl market change. We're seeing you know the the issues going on with uh, all the concert promoters and the streaming services. And I think you know, once all that stuff's rectified a little bit, at the end of the day, there's going to be one thing: live music. You're going to have all the AI stuff going on for recorded music. Yeah, it's going to put us hired musicians out of work. But at the end of the day, you're still going to have live music. Yeah. So, you know, I think once everything like that gets kind of propelled and, yeah. you know, moved into a, the, the position it was even pre-COVID and the cost of touring goes way down, you're going to see everyone kind of go right back to it. Yeah. You know, and there's going to be that built up energy that people are lacking. You know, you've got YouTube and you've got all these things that you can watch all these concerts and stuff but there's nothing that'll ever replace that experience experience. yeah man you know i would try you know uh our pal trevor lawrence he was you know two years ago at sofi stadium he played was he was the drummer at the super bowl backing up jay-z and everybody and um he did a clinic at uh forks and he was talking about ai i guess there's this site called udio right it's udio and you can basically use udio to like compose just about anything and then apparently if you take whatever comes from your ai prompts and you dump it into moises and you separate all the stems and then you get you get certain people to replace it's license free you've created something that you could monetize right this is scary well i think it also goes back to what's happened with um uh, who, who's it i think it's scarlett johansson uh That's- or is it or is it somebody else? One one of the big actresses are suing the AI companies for using her 
likeness basically or from her voice you know and i think that's what we're going to start seeing with um music too you know we're going to see more of these artists are going to start suing for their intellectual property their likeness their their sound you know and you know if you can even to the point to where it's like okay i'm going to type in a computer sound like the beatles and it sounds exactly like the beatles is it really copyright infringement it I think it should be if yeah. it sounds exactly like it, you know, because how do they create like how is AI generate? Because our friend Larry, I, I mentioned we, we were going to lunch the uh, to breakfast the other day and he basically typed into AI, write a song about Rich and Larry getting breakfast that sounds like a 1960s three chord country. And it came back. It was God don't bump bump bing don't Larry and Rich. I was like, what? It sounded exactly like Hank Williams or something. Have you, have you heard the one where they do the uh, just write a country song? No. And it's like you know, guns up your butt and boots in the oh, mud yeah. and mm-hmm. yes, yeah. so beer in your truck and you know, it's like trucks and guns and, and butts mud and, and mud. Butts. <laughs> Yeah, it's mud just, and butts. That's all it was. <laughs> but but at the same time, if you know if you, if you know how to clearly prompt the technology, you can write books, you can compose songs, and the the, the AI country pop songs are like, dang. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty it, good. But even then, I mean, there's the whole issue going on with Steve Marriott with from Humble Pie. Apparently, there's unreleased stuff, and they're trying to use AI to finish his vocal tracks. Oh, my God. I mean, God. he's been dead for 20, 25 years or whatever, and it's like, that's not real. That's and there's something with Randy Travis recently where he yeah. released an AI song, mm-hmm. and there was like 50-50 on both sides. I like this. What is this? Well, it, it's like, you know, I, I, I might be 29 in, in, in this current generation but yeah. i'm i'm the mold of the 70s and 80s studio guys yeah no one's ever going to replace jeff mccarl no one's ever going to replace vinnie Caliuta. no one's ever going to replace steve gadd and jim keltner and all those guys that played on every freaking record that came out of la in the 60s and 70s, 70s. and 80s yeah. and it's like that's the human quality that i don't think a computer will ever fix you know, yeah, they might have these technology that make it sound like it and, and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, there's a human human quality to that sort of stuff that I really don't think the consumers will ever fully grasp. Yeah. You know, um, remember the Lynn drum machine? Exactly. I mean, that was like, we're out of business. That was 45 years ago. And we're still you and I are live drummers. Exactly. And, and, and the Lynn drum machine, you know, who were the guys that they called in to program the Lynn Drum machines. Garibaldi, Garibaldi, um, Jeff, Keltner, yeah. you know, all these guys were the ones that were programming all the records. Lynn drums were the first electric. Drum. It was like a beautiful Roger Lynn created this gorgeous, it was about this big and it had wood panel on it, wood paneling on like it. Like everything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, like it was, uh, all, it, it was all the Prince sounds too. It was like a station wagon from Chevy Chase, you know, the, <laughs> the Christmas the, the, movie. The family truckster yeah. of uh, drum machines. But it had beautiful sounds. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, for example, uh, Tina Turner's What's Love Got to Do With It? Boom. Boom, boom. But those are the Lynn sounds. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Lynn 2 is all of the Prince sounds. Yeah. You know, so it's like we look back now and as the iconic Prince drum sound, and it was just a Lynn drum machine that everybody had access to back then, you know? Yeah. And at the end of the day, would it have sound differently if a real drummer would have played it? Sure. But it's, again, it was created by a human. It was, you, not, it was not a computer that someone typed in create x y and z and it pops it out there was still a human quality to those old school drum machines yes you know um like behringer's making copies of the the 808 and the 909 i encourage people all the time go buy them and just learn how to program these drums yeah. like these old school guys the, the boxes mm-hmm. yeah do you it, think that there's a uh, like a fatigue that will happen with ai in general because i mean one of the things that even in writing like an email I've noticed a pretty good uptick in just open emails by saying, written by a real human being. That's an edge right now. Yeah. You know well, what I mean? It, it, we, we've gone from sent by iPhone to now written by a human. Yeah. You know, it's it's crazy, you know, and, and it, I'm horrible, horrible at spelling in English, honestly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'll be the first one to admit I've used AI technologies to help write emails, you know, that, I, that snap, I'm doing. It's uh, just snap, uh, what is it, chat GPT thing? Yeah, chat yeah. GPT. Yeah. Yeah. Have you it's, used that, Rich, at all? Somebody demonstrated to me, they were like, hey, I'm... Uh, um, 
they were like, check out these parameters. You tell it. One, it was an African American gentleman that was like telling me about it. He goes, look at, I can make this. I can make it sound colloquial. Yeah. Basically, like yeah. it, like um, he said, there was two versions of the same way of communicating the same thoughts, and it was from his prompts. And he goes, look at this. I was like, oh my god, it's so convincing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. And, you know, yeah, we're seeing now, especially on YouTube, all of these crazy. I mean, I've had uh, some people that have sent me these videos and they're deadly convinced. And I've had to tell them, no, that's AI. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 it's not. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> you, it's, you know? it's really and it's, 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 disturbing. It's, it's so scary. And at the end of the day, what is it going to do? It's going to put us musicians out of work. You know, and but I mean, even to the point like you know, every music got so regimented that everything had to be so lined up with the grid, yeah. right? They can't have and if any flams, nothing. But if you go back to listen to the seventies, the early eighties, tons of, of flams, music, tons of flams, and you know, uh, tempo vacillations and variations. Yeah. You know, a absolutely. I mean, obviously they're they're working on tape and they'll do a different take and it'll be a different yeah. tempo. I love when you hear that cut and it it slows down two BPM. <laughs> you know, it's it adds that cool quality to it. You know, and it's 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 just such a interesting time that we're in right now. Obviously, we've all been saying that about the music industry for the last sixty years because more and more stuff changes and more as long stuff as comes about. As, yeah. as long as there's humans involved in music, yeah, yeah. we're good. It's going to change, but it's it's changing every single day. You know, I did. You remember the age of mashups? Oh, they still kind of do them for to a certain extent. We carried a uh, a radio show that did nothing but mashups. And it was just, he played his mashups, you know, different songs and stuff like that. And I did a mashup of Van Hill and Mean Streets with uh, a rap song at the time. It's on YouTube. You can actually find it. Um, <laughs> and when I was putting it on my editor, their song, the rap song, was perfectly right on the grid. But Alex was all over the flipping map. Mm -hmm. and so I kept on having to stretch and crunch and do all sorts Interesting. of stuff well, I, to I, beat matchups. I, I love the mashups that happen. You know, yeah. I'll put a Black Sabbath tune with James Brown vocals. It's it's killer. You know, oh, it's yeah. cool. It's it, That's creativity because that person still had to do it. Yeah. You know, um, but again, at the end of the day, I always revert back to the 70s and 80s studio musicians. Yeah. You know, these guys and gals would be perfectly aligned if there was a click but there was no click yeah. you know but even if there was they a did lope, by feel yeah they did it by feel they, even yeah. if there was a lope within the tune that played a big part of that tune God, you're such a young person to understand that and to be able to uh, to embrace that at the highest levels and be able to execute that as well but you know you bring up this idea of alex jim thank you this is a hot topic because Alex, did you bid on any of his stuff? Is not going to play drums again. He yeah. is cleaning out his closet, he, and he's making mad money. Well, you think about it. He's only but it's he for only charity. Played, he only oh, played, it is. Yeah, I he, thought he was walking with he, it. He only yeah. played with his brother. You know, right. so it's it makes sense. I he was they were selling a uh, a pearl uh, mahogany sensitone snare drum and uh, that apparently was shipped to them. I was like, oh, you know, maybe maybe I'll bid on it and yeah. And I, I didn't, but you know, it's 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 crazy because again, you look back at you know those those uh, late eighties Van Hagar records, and <laughs> you know they're they're I, I've been in a big Van Hagar mood recently, and just going back and listening to all of them, and you know the the, the Simmons the, the Simmons stuff. Even then, it was still human. It was still Alex Van Halen, no matter if it was all the Simmons samples or it was his, you know, Ludwig drums, it still was him. And that snare sound. Exactly. Yeah. Break out the duct tape. Well, oh, that's the thing is, is like, I, I, I just, I seen a video because Hagar and Jason Bonham and, and, uh, Satriani. Uh, it was they're, they're, Michael Anthony and yeah, yeah, Joseph yeah, Satriani. Yeah, they're doing yeah. that. They're doing that tour where they're just doing Van Halen stuff. And I, yeah. and I heard, you know, Jason Bonham and I heard that snare sound. I'm like, Oh, that's an Alex Van Halen snare sound. Then I thought about, it, wait a minute, no, that's a John Bonham snare sound that Alex Van Halen took and made it his own. You know, yeah. so it's it's yeah. But it, I thought Alex, Alex had a very specific with the tape and the direction. Yeah. He, he he did underneath the, the head <clears throat> under. You know, exactly. It was a very, but I mean, it was also the processing. You mm -hmm. know that that went into it too because my brother was a huge. Uh, you know, 1984 was a big defining album for him. He's a piano keyboard player, and he told me he says nobody's ever been able to duplicate the brass, the sound of the brass on All Weight and some of the other songs on that uh, that album. Well, you know? it, it, again, it goes back to you know the, these these musicians back then. Yeah, people can never replicate it. You know, right. I've been studying Rosanna for 15 years. 
I will never get close. No one will ever get close. You know, there's those little intricacies that these that these players put into their playing that just will never be replicated. Yeah. You know, I can put a drum beat into 90 different drum machines and it'll sound the exact same with different samples. Whereas us as, as humans, us as musicians, just it can't be replicated within that person. Yeah. You know, I know when I can play a Jason Aldean song, I can try to play like Rich Redman, but yeah. it'll never sound like Rich Redman. Because there's only one of us. We're snowflakes, exactly. right? Exactly. And, and you know, whatever song I play, it's just going to be sloppy as crap. Right? No, but it's it's very <laughs> yeah. intentional. There's a lot of heart. Um, you know, it, it screams Connecticut. We're both from Connecticut. <laughs> if, of, if it's Connecticut, it's sloppy. You know, <laughs> you know um, what was I going to say? We're, you know what? There's one style that I that is all the rage where, you know, there's some guys that are just masters of it. Like Trevor, my friend Trevor Lawrence is really good at it. Da Rue is really good at it. Where you can sound like that... I, it, that almost like drunk yeah, where it's yeah. like the kick and snare is on but the hat and they're and they're quantized but the hat is not like a dilla kind of a thing i've been working my whole life to try to be as tight as possible with the click so to do that i i'm i just have such a hard time yeah i mean it's it's it, it has its purpose in in the music that it's used for yeah you know i personally am not a fan of that that style but i, I can't do it you know it's it's it is very very unique to you know that genre that they use it for and there's so many so many players these days that are trying to do that versus try to learn a groove. Which, yeah, the, 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 and what like he, the Italian guy who's blowing up on TikTok. Oh, but that kid, right. that kid is crazy. Yeah, but he's like he. What did he do? He did uh, Rush Tom Sawyer, and every all the purists are like, dude, just don't, just stop. Don't did do. He, don't did, he do have all, did he have the multi service? Tom? No, he just basically had. Uh, I think he just plays like a floor tom, a snare, and a kick. And he, but he, he but he's like he's like it. doing you know with one hand you know and he's just one of these guys who's a, as you would say a circus drummer. <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> the guy's gonna come, I mean, no, he's gonna come over here with his posse and just just go after me because yeah. um, he could be in the mafia. But who knows? But no, I mean he's got some things where he's got like a glass of wine on his snare drum and he's like. Have you seen this guy? Yeah, I mean, there's, there, you know, we're we're crazy. we're in the land of TikTok and YouTube drummers. You yeah. know, it's it's great. You know, they 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 a lot of some of them have gone on to you know get gigs, and yeah. some of them are just there for their social media aspect he, of it. He, you he know, can, he can monetize great. the social media with 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 like shirts and hoodies, and and, and they do, and he'll probably yeah. he'll probably get be one of these rare guys that is actually paid to play a musical brand like the, right. the old Carmine Apathy days where it's like exactly. here's your salary to pay Slingerland drums for the year kind of a thing right because that disappeared a long time ago but is he going to um, do in-person clinics and is he going to uh, play music with other people yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, really, the the only example of that we see is Grace and Decruitman nowadays, and oh, you he's know, great. you know, he's playing yeah. with all these different artists, and you know, I remember, you know, artist relations at Pearl, you know, signing him really before he even broke on yeah. on the internet, and he's kind of like, you got to see this kid. Have he's, you seen he's, him? He's going to be great. No, he's actually no. A, a wonderful musician who. I think he kind of burst on the scene by doing tons of like Buddy Rich covers, mm -hmm. and he's got all the, you know, the combo, the yeah. stick, stick, and the. He's, he's well versed. I mean, but next thing you know, he's playing with suicidal tendencies. Yep, exactly. Like, got, got to gust, got to gust, got that whole thing. Wackerman, Brooks Wackerman, same kind of uh, yeah, approach. Exa exactly. You know what I mean? Even, um, oh man, who was the other guy I just had in my head? Old Man Marine. Never mind. Yeah, but Grayson. Doing, yeah, I mean, yeah. he's he's one of the rare exceptions that has kind of been able to break that mold, you know, yeah. and. I think it's 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 in a way kind of hindered our industry because you know us that don't really do the social media thing we've kind of now been forced to do the social media thing you have to you and know you got to do you like covers to. exactly yeah, you, you have a presence but you don't go crazy right exactly you know I, I throw out a couple videos here and there you know but it's it's not my my life you right. know I like being a studio musician yeah I'd rather people not see my face and be the guy that's on the record yeah you know and uh, doing the live gig and, and things like that. Use you know, the but, face while you have it. But you're smart enough to like put a GoPro <laughs> up uh, and you got some great angles on your kit with Ted. Mm. I've never tried that angle right in front of like between the crash symbol and the hi hats. I was like, oh, I don't want people to see if like I got like a little belly or something. But you know what I mean. But it's that's like why, that's why I don't put it on the side. You're just yeah. like, <laughs> you're just like, dude, man, you're just crushing it. And uh, companies, we're both Sabian guys, right? Yep. Great symbols, Remo. Yep, uh, Remo, Chris Stanky, um, Chris Hart, and Primark. 
Uh, Vader. Vader. So I got I, I got yeah. signed by Vader and Pearl the same exact week, um, yeah. 2005. Do they have so a I've, Darth model? They should. They should. They really Darth should. Darth Vader. Darth Maul. Sorry. No, it's great. But yeah, I mean, it. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been with Sabian, played Sabian my whole life. I I, I left. I never was endorsed by Sabian when I was a kid, um, and I, you know, I used Dream Symbols for a number of years, and they were great to me. Can small Canadian company it put me on the box, and you know all that stuff. And then when I joined Nugent, um, you know, it, I I wanted to go back to uh, playing what I know and grew up with, and Sabian, you know, and just the the best symbols. In the Which world. of course, what are your? I, I've been there since two thousand. Um, what are your go tos? Like I'm a I'm a fifteen sixteen inch hat guys twenty inch crashes. How about that, Chad Smith? It's no longer Chad Smith, but the, the Holy China. The China. Holy China has got to be one of the greatest sounding. I love those, but I actually use the AAX Extreme um, China because it has like this really wild kind of sizzle to it. AAX Extreme. Yeah. Um, 21, 19, 21? Uh, I think it's a 19. I oh. used the Paragon China for years, and then Chris Stanky came to one gig. He's like, hey, why don't you try this? Yeah. And and I tried it. I was like, that's it. There's my China. How Have you ever experimented, like, you know, with 35-inch symbols or anything like that? I talked to Keo Stroud about that. Yeah. <laughs> Keo's the guy to be like, we're going to take two gongs and make hi-hats. He's like a crazy, you know, thinker. He was always putting crazy stuff together. But maybe it's a thing. Yeah. You know? That Paragon um, ride symbol that Neil helped. I, I've you know. used that with Ted Ooh. for years. It's like, can slice off a dragon's head. And, <laughs> and, and, that's, and, that's, and that's why I use Whoa. it. Whoa. Because that ride symbol is going to cut right through those, those guitars that are yeah. stupid loud. Because Ted is not the kind of guy that's like, you're too loud. <clears throat> he's never going to be. He's not that guy, right? How do you no. go? I, well, mean, I, I, play, I play in the cage with yeah. Ted, and, and that's mainly because. Front of, of house front of house but also he has the uh the headset mic and oh it's God. he's right in front of it you know so it 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 cuts down on the cymbals you know plus it the at the end of the day my where my riser is my crash cymbals are right at his ears yeah so ears or a wedge uh he's on he's on uh wedge but me and the bass player on the ears it's just for protection i honestly i hate playing with a wedge yeah um i've used ears forever and i hate playing without them yeah you know because it just it, it number one i'm saving my ears yeah and number two i can just hear everything so much better and so much even if it's like a horrible mix I can still hear the intersequencies that are happening within the guitar player and the bass player. Yes. It kind of allows me to add a little bit more spice to it. I than think just that's playing. where, I think, you know, musicians in the last 20 years, I mean, I started using in ears in 2000. And I think that is where we're seeing this uptick in just the quality of musicians and how tight they can play is that we've got these things, high fidelity things in our ears. So you can hear the flam between the 808 loop and your kick drum. And if you're right with your bass player, it's like, if you're just playing Madison Square Garden, like Led Zeppelin with some wedges and it's all floating around. Yeah. It's amazing. They were as tight as they were. Yeah, exactly. Especially considering the technology. Yeah. You know, I mean, even to this day, I, I get on stage and there's wedges and no monitor uh, in ears and I'm like, how the hell do these guys hear? Yeah. You yeah. know, I have to wear my, uh, the, the, I use 64 audio and they make the molded earplugs. Yeah. I have to wear those if I'm using a wedge because if not, I ain't hearing a single damn thing. Yep. Wow. You yeah. know, I don't feel like blowing my ears off. No. I used to, I always just use the headphones like uh, Jim Riley. I can't, I couldn't do the in ears. No, you can. Yeah. You, you'd get used to it. I mean, your hair, I mean, is hair is so important. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's like if you wear those headphones, you know you. Then after the show, you got the big divot in your mohawk. It's look, just, look at me. Do you think I'm? <laughs> you know, I'm not exactly a chick magnet anymore. Man, you know, to a certain extent, I am. No. Well, well you, but, even, you know, even then in the studio, like I love using in ears in the studio. I hate the cans because it just it it number one that helps isolate everything that's going on around me. And again, being from that kind of studio mold player, yeah. I, I love a. Monitor engineers hate me because I want it to sound like a freaking record. Yeah. You know, I want to hear everything perfect and drum, big drums, big guitars and all that stuff. But you probably and have a, a w great working knowledge of telling them exactly how to achieve that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You yeah. know, so it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's, I can do the crappy in-ear mixes. Yeah. We all are going to have it, you know, a lot of times mm -hmm. in our career, but you know, I would still rather use them than not use them. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I uh, I use the headphones, and uh, I, f I wonder sometimes if when I'm playing, because I've been playing a lot more recently, 
up in the bedroom here at the office. And with some drums that I gave Jim. Yeah. Jim works for gear. That's what it is. It's a great, it's an amazing relationship. <laughs> That's what I do. Yeah. And uh, I find, I'm like, do am I playing harder because I'm trying to hear the articulation of all the symbols and everything? Do you guys got, do you, I guess you could feed that into your feed and get that. You, know, you get the overheads in right. there, yeah. Yeah, but he, but even then, I do find I do find that happen when it's a situation where there is no overheads. It's just you know, like if you're playing a gig downtown Nashville, there ain't going to be no good monitor mix. It's yeah. going to be whatever they give you. And sometimes I find myself if I'm playing down there, hitting way harder than I should. Right. You know, just try to hear those symbols, but. Do you feel like the fatigue in your arms and your wrists and everything? Oh, 100%. You know, yeah. I've, but over the years, I've tried to work on my technique and make sure that, you know, everything kind of works the way it does. But, you know, over over time, you know, I, I look at still, I'm almost 30 and been playing for, so you know. Old. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. But my, my tell my body that because my body thinks I'm 65. You know, I wake up <laughs> cracking. And, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a similar thing is, is, is like, you know, I do have... You know, there's going to be issues that can come about. So, how can you combat them before they do? do, you, do my left hand falls asleep, man. I wake yeah. up in my bunk with my left hand like tingling in the morning, and so I get up and you run under hot water and you stretch it and you do the thing and you try to warm up. Really, it's just amazing that the the body is holding up. You know, because you're cr taking this piece of wood and you're cracking it over this metal rim thousands of times a night, mm -hmm. every hundreds, night, hundreds of pounds of force. You know, it's 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 crazy. You guys, uh, I mean, you're holding onto the stick too tight, maybe, or no. you know, for the other thing is probably, probably going to use some uh, lubriderm. Lubriderm? Yeah. Oh, I saved that for other things. But anyways, um, <laughs> get it. Give me a splash bowl. But a splash yeah, he's got to find it or a toilet find. flushing or something. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, warming up, correct technique, molar technique. You know, you, you look at Kenny, you look at Liberty. You know. Get it. Very nice, Jim. <laughs> you got to have that ready to go, man. I, there's so many different tabs. I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, you, you know, you just, it was a little tingling. Here's, mm -hmm. here's a secret. Okay, and I, I discovered this. Uh, I don't know, probably about last year, sometime. Uh, we ended up getting a grounding sheet for our bed, and you sleep on top of it. You ever hear the technique of grounding? Yeah, putting your or you're putting your feet, your feet in grass. onto the earth. Yes. Yeah. And what that does is it rebalances, I guess, you know, the electronic you know, electrolysis or whatever, the electrical yeah. impulses of your body from and resets earth. everything yeah. from the earth. Yeah. And in everybody's house, we have a grounding rod, a literal piece of copper that goes in the ground, probably about 15 feet. And in a plug, the little, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the face yeah. in the mouth is the ground. And the blanket plugs right into that. Amazing. And you, you are grounded. So I, we started using it. And lo and behold, I'm going down the stairs one day, and I'm going, wow, my knees don't hurt. It literally was probably within a, a week or two. Maybe I, I should get that blanket. That's cool. Oh, dude, it's, it, what a difference. Is it on what Amazon a kind of a thing? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's pricey, but what a difference. Oh. Yeah. But what, what's pricey? Like, like pricey for Alex uh, Van Halen or for me? I want to say <laughs> ours. Uh, I mean, it's the one I have is a blanket, so it just covers me. Yeah. Uh, 140 maybe. Okay, all right. Maybe. Yeah. I can look it up if you so, want. So when you're watching Netflix, you put the grounding blanket on. Oh, it's like I feel like I'm not sleeping without my booby. Yeah, your booby. Yeah. Do, what do you What do you do for fun? What do you do for uh, for you know? You're listening to vinyl. You got a you got a lady friend. Uh, you, any other like things that we wouldn't know about that are like? Are you movie buff? Uh, you know, I I've been a. Uh uh, huge Disney park enthusiast for many years. Um, yeah. So I go to Disney World. <laughs> like Josh. Four, yeah, exactly. Just like Josh. I go to you know Disney World four or five times a year. When I would go to NAM, I'd come in a few days early and go to Disneyland, cross from the convention center. You wow. Know? So it's uh, it's always been a, a big hobby of mine, you know, in, in watching documentaries, reading books about the more of the technology, history, construction, architecture, that sort of thing. Coasters? You're a roller coaster guy? Absolutely not. No, yeah. <laughs> I don't that, I don't do drops, I don't do spinny stuff, I no. don't do that. What's your I mean, favorite ride at Disney? Well, Haunted Mansion, Pirates, yeah. the, like the classics, you yeah. know. Um, You're like an old soul, dude. Yeah, he really I, is. I, I've been told that my entire life. I, I'm wondering. <laughs> I was going to ask about that. Yeah. No, he's like, a know, he's a renaissance man and he's a you're you're a there, is, there, there's, this isn't a, such a word, but you're like a practicalist. I mean, it's like everything you do is is practical application for your God given talents, and you know what I mean. It's like he, you are an old soul. Yeah. He is. Oh yeah, beyond your years. Well, how, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, you're you're already like dating yourself. I'm going to be thirty. 
Well, Wait, you, you know what give to be gotta, thirty again for crying out loud? I know, but you got, with the knowledge that you have, which is right. impossible. Well, yeah. it's 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 it, you know it can be tough. You know, just yeah. trying to make sure I have the right perspective and you know life and what I've done and you know what I'm going to do in the future and you know things like that. And especially in this industry, you're changing all the time. You know, I've been with Ted for nine years, yeah. and now we're only playing two shows this year. So it's like, okay, well, what am I doing next? Re- you know? Reinvent. Are you next worried chapters. about it? No, absolutely no. not. You know, I, gonna I just, I love, I love doing what I do. You know, I love being in the industry I am. You know, I love being around the people that I'm around, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, 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 it keeps my, 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 my toes up because you never know what's going to be called. You know, I've been on a rock gig forever, but I've done, you know, I was on the road this past weekend with a country TikTok artist, you know, so it's going from that to that, to this, to that, you know, it just, it always keeps it exciting. It keeps it interesting and, you know. And, you know, I love going from playing to a click on a gig to not playing to a click on a gig, reading yeah. charts on a gig to not reading charts on a gig. It's just, it's always a hodgepodge of ever, ever, everything. But keeping that perspective and, and knowing that, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to have been to have done what I've done, but there's still more on the horizon. Oh, yeah. So you're always moving for, and if, if I quit the music industry today, I could still look back and say I was, you know, proud of what I've accomplished in my life. You've nice. done a lot more than most people on the planet. Yeah, I'm so. very, very fortunate for that. You know, it's, yeah. it's. Uh, I'm not a religious man, but you know, I do believe in karma and I believe in the universe and everything happens for a reason. And yeah. you know, it's, it's uh, a whole separate. Topic. I love me some yeah, law exactly. of attraction. I tell you, me, I'm a student <laughs> of that. Sometimes I don't. Uh, you know, the other night I was, uh, we were, at, me and Jim were having our little dinner party, and I was. I had my violin out and I was like, and he was like, um, this is from the motivational speaker, but sometimes the motivator needs the motivation. You know what I mean? Sometimes, sometimes mentors need mentoring, you know, sometimes the clown just isn't happy. Yeah. That makes other people happy. Oh, exactly. Makes other people laugh. Clowns are scary as hell. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's because you watch Terrifier. Oh, Terrifier. Are, are you a horror buff at all? Absolutely not. I, I, <laughs> but, but, even, but even though Jaws is my favorite movie of all time. So. Yeah, but, but you, but re- like, you, you know, rarely see the shark because it yeah. didn't work. But they made it work. They made it work they because it work. it's it's better because you're s- afraid of the thought of the shark. Yeah. Because the shark was kind of cheesy. And most of the people around Destin and the Gulf Coast this past weekend or two are very far are, uh, are finding well. out, you know, for a fact, you know, the shark is around you at any given moment. But what is they, and they always have been, but, but what is this with these attacks in two feet of water? Something is going on. Yeah, that's why I it's never step foot in ocean <laughs> because they'll come out and get you. What's scarier, what? the ocean or the lake? Ocean. You think so? Because lakes are I don't just go, like, I can't see the lake, though. Dark, yeah. bottomless pits of despair. I don't go in either. I'd rather just give me a pool. No. <laughs> I, like, I like to be by it. At a Disney resort. Yeah, exa- exactly. Yeah. I like to be by it. Now, I want to do the Disney thing because I'm the same way. I don't like the big, scary rides. But also, there's all that history and there's all the little a- actors in their little suits running around. The food's got to be pretty good, too. Oh, it's, I would it's, think. It's, it's the best, you know. Um, and especially Disneyland. You know, you have the history of Walt was there and he you know, built the place, you know, and, and even the musical history, the, the, um, Carnation Gardens, you know, back in from the fifties to the eighties, Count Basie, Louis Belson, Buddy Rich, Rich. like, it was like ev- a house gig, everyone played there, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and Cap- Is there still live music happening a lot at Disneyland? Uh, not, not as much as there was, yeah. um, you know, but it's, it's still a, just such a rich history in, in all that stuff, you know, and, and I've talked with Kathy Rich about this many times because her and Greg are, massive disneyland people as well yeah. and it's it's like you know going on a saturday night to see buddy rich at disneyland like how cool can it get it doesn't get more american than that exactly, exactly. apple pie so, apple pie and buddy rich buddy rich like they always say i'm gonna get a real band in here i told you motherfuckers uh, <laughs> <laughs> no facial hair in my band it's as american as apple pie baseball and buddy rich <laughs> Now, old man uh, Disney didn't always. There's some. I don't think they called him that, Rich. Yeah. Old man Disney. I don't think they referred um, to Walt as old man Disney. But they, they, he, <laughs> he had doesn't have like a perfectly squeaky clean reputation. Oh no, no, no! He died from smoking. Yeah, you know, and he drank whiskey, which yeah. was uh, you know? back in the day. Smoking was considered to be a uh, benefit for your health. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, he died at sixty. Lucky strikes. Early mid sixties. Yeah, you know, and that's young. Just smoking and drinking and like one of my that like they've literally photoshopped cigarettes out of so many iconic photos the company has. Oh wow! You know, and uh, 
I, I always love trying to find the photos of Walt screaming in a meeting. Because, He's like this. Because yeah. you know that he wasn't actually a nice boss. He was a slave driver. He was like, get it done now yeah. type situation. You don't build the empire you do being the nicest guy in the world. Look at Steve Jobs. Exactly. Yeah. You know, And it's, you look at the imperfections. The perfections are there point out the imperfections and i sometimes unfortunately get like that too much you know i'd look at the negatives but it's like if you got all the positives you know those positives are gonna work you think walt so, disney would be canceled today <laughs> you never know you i never mean know. it's it's uh but that's what i'm saying like there is some bad stories about his hiring practices yeah and all that kind of stuff. i mean and that that was all of corporate america back then yeah, you know? yeah. so it's it's the it mad men era exactly you yeah. know Everybody but, had a liquid lunch back then. Yeah, mar a couple martinis at lunch and smoked a bunch of cigarettes. Then and they come just back kept on whiskey. going, yeah. What's with all the spots on that couch over there? Yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah, just cigarette yeah. burns. Yeah. I like a good martini, but I just don't know how you would do it at lunch and then be productive after lunch. You know what I mean? Because the liquid lunch was there to loosen up the clients. Gotcha. All right. Especially in the advertising world, they take them out, get them all liquored up, and sell them, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of ad campaigns. So yeah, exactly. Smart. So yeah. smart. Yeah. Now, I listen to, I usually will try to listen to a podcast or two or go do a deep dive on YouTube with our guests. There's this Los Lobotomies record that you love, right? Mm hmm. I think I had it on CD. What's it, Live at the Baked Potato? Is that right? Well, it was, it, 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 it was cut at um, the, um, I'm blanking the name of the studio. It was actually cut at the studio. Yeah. But the Lost Bottomings was, you know, part of um, that Baked Potato scene. It was scene. like Lukather, Lukather, Vinny. Well, it was it different. Lost Bottomings was mainly Lukather, Picaro, um, David Garfield, you know, a um, bunch of different bass players. Sklar. Yeah, Leland or Jimmy Johnson yeah. or all those guys. But the actual Lost Bounties record they cut in the studio, and it was Carlos Vega, Jeff, Vinny, um, Will Lee on bass. Um, and a couple of years ago, I, I ended up putting it on vinyl through my company. Because I was just like, it never been on vinyl. It's, you know, super cool. And, um, you know, I, I we even restored the original art um, that Jeff painted by his hand. And I was the one that did it in photoshop and i was it was the most wild experience of my life my you know probably my top drummer of all time jeff Picaro, and i'm sitting here on photoshop in 2020 whatever is that 21 or 22 when we did that and i'm with a digital brush putting over jeff's signature to enhance it on the on the record it, wow. you know, it was just wild experience for me you know being a drummer doing a you know something that an iconic drummer did but it had nothing to do with drumming Amazing, you know. I so what is what is uh, the business behind something like that? It, it's you got to get into fine print contracts, legalities to to get the rights to put something like that out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and David Garfield uh, owned the rights to all that stuff. So I worked with him and all that. You know, and the the, the actually we did that in 2019 um, because Nugent was we were rehearsing in L.A. to start the tour and. Um, we had just put out the record and I seen that uh, David was playing up in the West Villages or I think, I think it was Low at West Lake or something like that. North, North LA and Joe Picaro was on drums and you know, I'd never met Joe and I had actually flown in earlier to go to Sabian and pick up some stuff from Chris Stanky Burbank. and, and uh, I was going to stop at Jeff's grave up in the, um, uh, the you know, cemetery that he's in. And I never, I hate, cemeteries with a passion is he in the hollywood forever cemetery he, he's in uh um uh, the hollywood hills um forest lawn gotcha and um you know right by disney and all the burbank studios and i went and go visit him and uh, you know his grave and i can't stand funeral you know uh, cemeteries so it was a weird experience for me but that night i went up to north hollywood and seen joe yeah 90 years old playing drums. playing the drums best jazz drummer i've ever seen live and you know that he he passed you know less than a year later and i i think that was might have been his last gig and got to meet him and just like it was a wild experience to you know do it but um you know just to see this icon you know not just that his son was jeff Carl, but also the amount of sessions that joe did you know as a percussionist just meeting some of these guys that were part of the wrecking crew and part of that scene from that era yeah. Yeah. just was amazing for me so, uh that was 2019 yeah because that's when i met joe Percaro as well i met him at nam 2019 he was charming funny 
firm handshake was he was just happy to talk and like, it was great. I was so happy I yeah. got to talk to him. Yeah. I mean, and so many people don't even realize the amount of stuff because Jeff kind of overshadows oh, cartoons, his career, TV shows, but every movie out of that era he played on. Yeah. It's just insane. I was always very almost like starstruck with ML Richards mm-hmm. and his collection of percussion and stuff. And you know that a big portion of, I think a lot of his instruments are now owned by um, Danny Elfman. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean Emil, ha- Emil had the largest... Well, he's who brought Joe from Connecticut to L.A., which obviously changed the you know course yeah. of music history. Yeah. He said, you could do it. You could hang out here, man. You know? And Have you guys seen the... Uh, there's a new Netflix documentary. It might be Netflix, but it's about the Beach Boys. Uh, Disney Plus. Is it Disney Plus? Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. And they, they, all those got low. It's amazing to watch the process those guys went through, especially with uh, Pet Sounds. Oh, well, I mean, Pet Sounds was put, those guys were put up against the Beatles yeah. quite a bit. Well, I mean, and, and, you know, you look at Pet Sounds as just, again, the, the pinnacle of session players. Yeah. All the wrecking crew, it's the wrecking crew with Beach Boys singing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's it's those those records, those that that time being able to you know, Hal Blaine had five different rigs that would just go from studio to studio, and he would go from Sunset Sound over to Capitol over to you know all these places, and you know do five sessions in a day, and it's like man, that's 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 the time that I always try to long for. You know, we'll unfortunately never get back. Yeah, to that and, day, t- but. and Kenny Aronoff's words. It'll never happen again. Yeah, absolutely. Never which, say never. Which sucks. But you, but you know, um, Hal was smart. He always had kit A on all of his kits. Yeah. Because some producers <laughs> would be like, I want kit A. Yeah. Well, why, why do I have kit D? <laughs> so all, all of his kits were kit A. That's uh, Or good. kit one or whatever. Marketing right there. So smart. Hal That's was, very smart. And he had the gift of gab. He always had the latest joke. There's, a, there's such an art to being able to tell a typical... Right hook, right hook, left hook, um, joke. You know, yeah. with, with a punchline. I suck at it because I know the punchline, and I can't <laughs> wait to get there. Can we talk a bit more about the Alex Van Halen raffle? Well, yeah, you, or, you know, auction. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, that's that, that's that's big news. You know, I mean, for, especially for a, you know one of the most iconic drummers of in our in our history. I didn't know he was yeah. giving it all to charity. That's incredible. I, that's from what I know. Yeah, because I mean, he's for a while there that fifty one fifty kit didn't move. <clears throat> it sat at seventy five grand, and then at the end, I think it, <clears throat> it went for about one hundred and eighty five. I want to wow. say, and then the last kit that he did that you played on at the Nashville Drummers Jam, yeah, a tribute. I did all wait. Yeah. I think that was uh, one hundred and thirty five. Wow! But it came at least came with cymbals and hardware. Wow! You know, well, all that the, stuff. the thing that I find <clears throat> so interesting is you know we we see. We see how much these guitars that are owned by legendary guitar players go for. Yeah. They're going for 300, quarter million, 100 plus. How often do drum sets go for okay. over 100? Right. Almost, um, for how much does guitars by legendary guitar players go for three? Siri wants to chime in, apparently. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, you know, Stuart Copeland sold his iconic blue Tama kit on all the police a couple of years ago. I don't even think it went near 100. You know, and it's oh, like yeah. these. If that was a guitar, sometimes the guitars are even starting, you know, just almost at 100, just being the guitar itself. Then you add the fact that it was the artist. So, you know, are there kits that are going to go for more than what Alex has just did? What's the deal Very with few. the guitars, man? It's, they just, it's a much better investment. Well, I think that you have more iconic attributions to a guitar. You know, Eddie Van Halen's Frankenstrat would be a million dollar plus guitar. If Wolf ever wanted to auction it off, well, it's a, but, it's it's the same thing with you know Ted with his Birdlands. These yeah. are iconic guitars, and but it's Prince's same, guitar, but right? exactly. But the same, <laughs> there's the same thing with drum sets, though. You know, you've got so many iconic drummers that use iconic drum sets. Yeah, you know, why isn't the value equal to that? Because you know, I, I don't think strange. the general public really drummers pay attention to it. Mm. I think the general public would. I just think there are a lot of more people that are consumers of music that would know what a Pete Townsend guitar, Eddie Van Halen, any of those guitars, Randy Rhodes, Zach Wild, they would be oh that I know that guitar, you know the fifty one fifty drum kit, the you know the, the uh, see through um, acrylic yeah, drum kit yeah. is known to us guys because right. I mean, we watched that live without a net till it was worn thin, um, but I was surprised to see that the nineteen eighty one Gong. With the stripes around the uh, frame, yeah, went for two hundred and eighty-seven thousand dollars. Amazing! That's a insane. forty-inch Peisty gong. 
Can with you imagine stick. having that just kind of expendable income? I'm going to buy a right. gong stand. It's, it's, got, it's got to be the most expensive symbol ever sold. Yeah. Oh, gosh. That's insane. I mean, quarter million dollars, over a quarter million dollars for a gong. I didn't, I didn't realize he never played Black Beauty snares. What was the I snare? I thought he did. I, I always thought he was, yeah, Superphonic or oh, something. Oh, Superphonic, yeah. yeah. But he played Tama, um, like Redwood type snares. Yeah, there was a bunch of those Tama snares yeah. for sale, too. But I found that very interesting, you know? Well, yeah. that, that's the thing is, is that he, they had one pearl snare for sale, and it was a mahogany yeah. pearl snare. that He was big had, on wood snares. They apparently was going to try to use for a recording session, and it just never ended up happening. And and when I seen that, I thought that was very strange. Yeah. G- yeah. Given that he's one of the most iconic Ludwig guys yeah. ever, you know, to have those, you know, certain random Tamas and Pearl and, and C&C and just a Noble and Cooley and stuff like that thrown in there. Yeah. Um, you know, I, every, 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 most drummers are guys that play other brands and yeah. swap other brands. You know, I my drum collection is pretty huge, but it's all Pearl. But even then, you always got to have at least one Ludwig. You always got to have. I mean, you've been requiring Pearl drum since you were nine years old. Yeah, right. (laughs) I mean, that's. uh, Yeah, you're gonna just need a big old house for those drums, man. Well, you know, it's it, but it's it's like with you. You got a ton of DW kits, but you always got to have at least a a Gretsch snare or a Slam or Ludwig. You always got to have that one or two. Little no, but I was I was very shocked how many non Ludwig drums were in that auction. Wow. Yeah. We need a guy to to become completely iconic that plays nothing but CB seven hundred drums. <laughs> well, I mean, they were made by Pearl. Yeah. Really, I didn't know that. Same yeah. factory, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amazing. What did that stand for? Was CB like a? I don't know. I mean, Pearl made so many stencil kits back in the seventies and eighties. You yeah. know, a, a lot of those were just you know a uh, uh, Max Win and CB seven hundred, and a lot of those just random ones were made in. You know, the f- same thing with Tama, because they were both made in that area in Japan, yeah. pretty much right by each other. So a lot of those weird Japanese stencil kits were either Tama or Pearl. And Alex's uh, drum throne, I think, went for uh, seven or eight thousand dollars. It's like oh, we got some Alex's butt sweat in here. <laughs> well, it's it says you know thou shall not sit. That's the one. Oh, nice. Yeah. No one. No, no one but no, him. No one sits on his throne. That's crazy. Except you. Was that, was that the throne that they had? I don't know. I, did. I should have asked his uh, drum tech, um, John Douglas. Hmm. Crazy. Well, he's got a book coming out. So. John Douglas? No, Alex. Oh, Alex. Well, well, good good the, for him. The, the biggest thing is, is I, you know, hopefully they start bringing out some of this vault stuff because at 5150, they've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of all this unreleased stuff. And, yeah. you know, that's kind of where we are in this in this part of the industry is is you know these artists going back into their personal archives and stuff that they own personally and like these fans want this they want the built up energy you know they have all this content they've been hearing the same records for 40 50 years yeah new remaster cool but yeah. how much difference is that master really we took down the high end of the snare just a tad yeah. And put a little more compression on the bass line. Well, like, you know, White Snake did remixes <laughs> of of um, the Slide It In record. I love that record. And, like, yeah. Cozy Co- Cozy's drums already sounded amazing on it. Yeah. The remix <laughs> sounds even bigger. You know, yeah. stuff like that, that's cool. But, you know, remasters, unless it's a big noticeable difference <laughs> if the original master was terrible, you know, people want rough mixes. People want live outtakes. People want different takes of the actual song you know those are the cool things that yeah. and i think what's going to continue sustaining a lot of these legacy artists is going back into their vaults and picking out those things because these fans want to hear this stuff yeah. you know we started doing with ted's catalog a couple years ago and and you know i've been archiving his his uh, vault for the last two years and the stuff that we found is amazing i found the demos for the first ted nugent record on a cassette you know we've got stranglehold and motor scene madhouse and all this stuff in a working you know, rehearsal space. Yeah. It has, we haven't released it yet, but it's, you know, those, that's what people want to hear. People yeah. are going to, are, are going to buy that and going to grab that up more than a, here's the ninth color of the same record that was been already pressed 10 different times. Yeah. You know, would it be weird if Wolfgang actually did that? You know, cause I guess once, you know, I hate to put it this way, but once Alex is kind of out of the picture, he'll have full rights, I guess, to do that. Is it weird when Prince's estate started doing it? I don't know. You know, Prince's estate immediately started going, you know, in that vault. And They're like, <laughs> it, it, exactly. Well, yeah. it, and, and, 
but what is what is it doing to that artist's legacy right it's helping sustain it it's help continuing to release more the name is continuing to be set exactly it's it's not the same records and and songs that have been out for 40 years you know now we're getting new material by these legacy artists that it's 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 like old new stock of gear you know people love finding old new stock stuff yeah. Exact same thing with all this vault, you know, material. They want that, those rough mixes, those. Just yeah, if they're the small. true fans, want all the extra stuff. Oh yeah, I would imagine like even uh, I think it was on uh, Amazon or one of the streamers. Uh, behind the music is another one with Wolfgang, mainly with Wolfgang and Valerie Bertinelli. Yeah, talking about uh, Wolf and Eddie's relationship, and even Alex didn't chime in on that. He's, uh, he does not want to be public at all. I knew that at that point. I'm like, I watched it, and I'm going, yeah, he's he's done. Well, you I know. mean, but, you know, they're starting to. I think next next month they've got a, you know, deluxe edition of one of the, the Van Hagar records, and they have live concert and video, and it's only a remaster, but, you know, at least they're starting to dip their toes into that. You know, yeah. I think they, they were supposed to, like, 20 years ago put out a, a rough mix version of the first album, or one, one of the first albums, and Warner just shelved it or something like that and you know it's circling around the um bootleg community and things like that but again when you have it especially brands all these legacy artists are brands so why don't we continue to expand on that brand and bring these vault lost gems out for these consumers amazing amazing hey um we're gonna finish up with the uh the fave five fave color Mm, red or blue? No, oh, all American, like Ted. Blue. <laughs> I like like that. I like uh, favorite drink. Um, probably root beer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. I, I like a good cream soda every once in a while. Oh, what about the PB and J beer? I Diet you. cream. Hey, don't know. Jim had got Dude. me a PB and J beer the other night. It was like this is a beer. It tasted like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It was amazing. It was. It was. I got. I'm going to finish it tonight. Yeah. Favorite food or favorite dish. Mm, yeah, I'm a sucker for a good filet with a you know mushroom risotto type thing. Nice. Now here in town, it, the price of dining out is anywhere in the world is getting more and more expensive. You used to go to PF Chang's, you get Chang spicy for thirteen ninety nine. Now it's twenty three ninety nine, right? So if you're a filet man, you know you're not getting out for like forty five, fifty, fifty five. But occasionally, like I go to Brick Tops. I love Brick Tops. They're good, ladies and gentlemen. You want to run into me? I'll be at the Brick Tops on McEwen Boulevard in Cool Springs. <laughs> That's where I, I'm at. The I'm, I'm getting my fillet, so they they do a good fillet. Um, now this is a difficult one, but maybe it's you love the artist, you love the melody, you love the drummer, you can't escape it. One of your favorite songs? Well, it's it's tough. You know, I always. I always look at you know uh, songs like you know Rosanna. It's just a classic. Um, Bob O'Reilly by the Who. Three freaking chords, but yeah. it's which is one of the most powerful songs ever. You know, I I love those type of things. I'm a sucker for great pop hooks, but yeah. also that have so much musicality behind it. You know, and I look at those type of songs that will never be replicated, no matter how much you can try, it will never sound like it. Yeah. Whereas opposed to if it was just you know, even a lot of the top forty songs that people would say, you can pretty replicate it easily so finding those little teeny tiny details that can really enhance those easy pop songs are yeah. what i always try to I'm, I'm i'm a little stuck you know people are like what's the new stuff you're listening to i'm like well i you know i mean i'm willing to check out vampire weekend or one of these you know right. more modern bands but you know it's like sticks and foreigner and john wade are on tour this summer and it's like missing you john wade Classic. It's an all-time favorite. Um, feels like the first time. Foreigner. Mm-hmm. All-time classic. Renegade. It's like, yeah. Am I? Am I an old man? Am I? No. Uh, I mean, I listened to very few music past 1991. Yeah. And you know, I listened. So to, the cutoff was Brakash, the Brakash, the Brakash, the Brakash, the Bang a Tank. Yeah. But even then, you know, Dave Grohl's playing on that stuff is just epic, unreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, how about um, this? Is equally challenging, but a favorite movie? It's on. You're like, oh, there goes the rest of my afternoon. Oh, I got to sit through this. Jaws, Jaws. Instantly. Okay, I mean, nice. <laughs> Back to Future, Jaws, Blazing Saddles, you, Young Frankenstein, wow. all those, all those classics. classics. He is an old soul. He really is. You really are a get off my lawn guy already at 29. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can ask my wife about that. Right, nice. <laughs> so, how long have you been married? Uh, about a year. About a year. Yeah. Nice. yeah. 
Right nice. Um, so, jasonheartless.com, nice website. You're on the socials. You're new to Nashville. Everybody look up Jason. Reach out to him. He's doing some, you know, you could make a killer living down on Lower Broadway. So he might be down on Lower Broadway. He might be on the big stage. He might be doing a showcase at, uh, you know. Any, the, pretty much I say get yes to every gig. Even gigs I shouldn't say yes to, I just say yes because I'd love doing it. Yeah, I like I like to play, man. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for doing this, man. And welcome to Nashville. I'm I so happy that. you're part of this community. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Jim, good good one right today. We went long. Good. Fun conversation. A really fun conversation. Yeah. Hey, to all the listeners, thanks so much for uh, listening and watching us. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Helps people find the show. Jason, thanks so much, man. Thank you, man. Jim, thank you. Take care. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts. 